everybody. So thank you for coming to our panel, Managing Trust in the Sharing Economy. Um, I'm Andreas Sodiades. I'll be moderating today. Um, I manage fraud and risk at Lyft, uh, the ride sharing company I'm sure you guys have heard of. Um, let me introduce the, the panel. We have Pam Dixon, who is the executive director of the World Privacy Forum. We have AJ Yadav, who's the CEO and founder at Rumi. We have Lucien Devo, Devo, sorry, <laughs> direct, uh, director of digital economy at LexisNexis Risk Solutions, and Alexander Martin, who's the CEO and founder of AC Global Risk. Great. So I think one of the things that's so intrinsic to sharing economy companies is that we're facilitating. Uh, these offline interactions between people that don't know each other. And it's very important that we authenticate the people that we are connecting to each other, but it's imp more importantly that we maybe do it in as frictionless a way as possible. And you know, how do we go about doing that? Lucien? Yeah, sure, I'll take the first one, why not? Hi everybody, so I think you know the way I see this is that the vast majority of transactions are actually going to be benign, and so the idea is not to create a frictionless experience for everyone, but really to understand who posed the most risk and to create the right authentication mechanisms for those small minority users. And so if you can do some very light sort of authentication and verification up front, whether it's device intelligence, whether it's um, simple data-driven authentication, I think at that point you can identify the more risky users and do some step up authentication and, and add that layer of friction. So whether that's um, an OTP or uh, authorizing a government issued ID, that way, you know, this vast majority comes through with a very low clean experience and you have this subgroup that you can do some step up authentication where it's necessary. Hi, that was so well articulated. <laughs> so, um, uh, Obviously, I do work at the World Privacy Forum, so um, something that isn't in the program but that I need to mention is I'm also a member of the Expert User Group and the Privacy Committee at the um, Biometrics Institute. Um, so I'm kind of wearing both hats. Um, let me speak first uh, in regards to the, the authentication. So just to, just to kind of um, add something in, tangentially related, but very important for, I think, everyone who's doing authentication. Um, on May 25th, I do believe almost everyone has heard of the GDPR or the General Data Protection Regulation. I bet everyone has heard the drumbeat. So I'm not going to say that it's the most heinous or most amazing thing ever. But what I will say is that because it's very difficult to know who's coming from the European Union, um, you, I think there are important choices to be made in regards to how you're authenticating in terms of that law. So um, I think another step I would say is uh, make a decision about how you're going to handle um, members of the European Union. Because if someone is a member of the European Union, you will have to apply different privacy laws to them and it will change the authentication experience. I mean, I, I can say, um, I can agree with both of you guys. And I think at Rumi, what we've done is we kind of see as like different platforms require different authentication. So it depends what type of transaction or what type of uh, purpose you have on that platform. So let's say for us, if you're trying to find a room uh, to share with someone else or maybe you're renting a room, that's a very private sensitive matter. You know, you don't want to just randomly move in with someone. So that case, I think what we realized, adding more friction can be sometimes good, even though it does increase like number of steps. So asking firsthand, hey, you know, yes, Facebook is like one click, it, good. But the second step, hey, I really do need your driver's license or passport. You know, just take a picture. And if you're not willing to do that, that means you're not trying to build that trust for yourself in the community. So I feel adding some steps can be painful, but I think depending on the platform, it can be the right choice. So I think steps can be more or less depending what you're trying to do. Can I just say that maybe slightly different way? Because I think what, what you're eating on is uh, only as need be. So perhaps when you register at Rumi, you need minimal information, and there's no need to sort of do uh, significant screening at that point. It's only at the point of transaction or booking, perhaps, that you introduce these additional layers. And so, you know, it's all about timeliness and um, appropriate kind of authentication. 
that, that all makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, one thing you mentioned, Pam, was uh, biometrics, and you know, I think that while biometrics aren't necessarily a silver bullet, how do we think that we can continue to leverage them um, as a way to authenticate our users? Maybe Alexander, you have some experience there. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, kind of how I think about this is pretty much the understanding that there's a tension going on here between you know revolutionary and that which is evolutionary. So kind of from that understanding, this trust sharing economy, what's happening is, is, is transforming um, every, every market, um, retail, transportation, you know, healthcare, everything's tra changing. So this is a revolutionary phenomenon. The evolutionary part is the human beings that interact and we are driven by our DNA and we're creatures and animals and we have instincts and past performance and biases, all these things that feed into how we interact with each other. Um, and trust. Trust is an evolutionary process as well. In the panel yesterday, they talked about the different stages of trust and how that blends into safety and security. So when I think about biometrics and how that feeds in, um, you know, again, not a silver bullet, I think about the gap between that which is revolutionary and that which is evolutionary and kind of come to the conclusion, like we talk a lot about uh, AC Global Risk, is how we can do that trust gap resolution and we can do, do so in a way that kind of creates a revolutionary technology to, to close that gap between the revolution and evolution. And I think that revolutionary trust technology is actually a couple things. I think it's one, it's multiple technologies. So it's holistic. So it includes many different uh, pieces of information and data that feed um, into this uh, larger technology. I think it's AI driven. Um, I also think it's tied to a process that is transparent, um, that has uh, the opportunity fairness for, for the user um, and also has a feedback loop to ensure that, it, that it's getting smarter and, and actually driving towards the desired end state. And finally, I think that this machine that we're talking about, this revolutionary technology, I think is tied to human being. Um, and you have that element of human, human machine teaming um, that is able to kind of take this holistic, biometric driven, you know, experience um, and continually improve uh, both for a security standpoint, but also for the users. So, it's just kind of that tension between, between revolutionary and evolutionary and how biometrics feeds into that. I think I really like the, the way you're kind of uh, visualizing that. Um, biometrics, I, what I like to tell people who, who ask about biometrics, I say it's math, not magic. And um, in regards to biometrics, I agree completely that it, it should be part of a, a very nuanced, multi-layered approach. At this point, um, the digital ecosystem is extraordinarily complex, as each of you uh, sitting here knows. And as a result, basically the silver bullets have left the room. So it's time to um, make sure you have a layered uh, approach. If you're going to use uh, biometrics, think about using multifactorial biometrics as opposed to one biometric. I know that might sound odd um, coming from a privacy expert, but it, it actually is a, a much better approach than just, you know, taking this biometric or that biometric. And then the second thing I would say in terms of responsible use of biometrics, two things. One is make sure that whoever your vendor is, or if you are the vendor, but whoever whoever's doing your biometric install and program, make sure that they have a very robust back-end security update protocol for you because biometric spoofing is real. It's a very significant problem that folks don't like to talk about, but it's a well-known problem. And um, there are some new spoofing techniques that are quite difficult to detect. Um, the third thing I would say is if you're going to use biometrics, I would really urge you to make sure that you have quite significant consent mechanisms in place because of the movement of both the GDPR and also U.S. state law. Um, in Illinois, the Biometric Information Privacy Act requires consent. Um, there's uh, a number of bills in a number of states that are pending, including New York and Alaska, which would also require consent. So the safe way is to build it into the system. Maybe just one last point to add about that is for account takeover fraud, for example, mm -hmm. biometrics makes a lot of sense. Yes. But if someone has stolen your identity and they're creating a profile and using their own biometrics, right. you're kind of at a loss there. So you've got to be real thoughtful about where these technologies are appropriate. I so agree with that. It's actually one of the huge problems in the use of uh, biometrics for patient authentication in healthcare. So thank you for adding that. Great. So I think, you know, we're kind of talking about this building these identity of our user base and 
the idea uh, of the offline identity is kind of becoming outmoded. Like we can no longer rely upon it. Um, it's very spoofable uh, in a variety of ways. You know, how else do you think we can get better about constructing a, a wholly digital identity for our user base that is secure and authentic? A very small little question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll open that up to. Should have probably picked better for this one. Um, so, I think. You know, you started off by talking about how we are connecting people in the digital world that eventually interact in the physical world. And so I think getting away entirely from the physical identity is um, a fool's errand. We have to understand what they are like in the real world. Um, the digital identity is somehow part of that and allows us to um, understand who they are in, in the digital world that's got to somehow for us, for us as a company, tie into what you are like in the physical world. Because if you are going to, you know, stay in someone's home or get into a, um, their vehicle, we've got to understand what is their risk profile in a in a physical realm. And so, we just acquired threat metrics, for example, and that for us helps us tie in the digital and identity of their devices into their physical world. And so that's a mechanism for us to link the two, but always understanding that you've got to take a holistic view on these users. Yeah, and I think a key component to this is that there's a, there's going to be a, there's, we're in a transition phase before this is, right? So there's still a lot to be done. So we need that, the holistic idea around this uh, is, is paramount. Um, and this introduces the idea of as we go through that transition from a security standpoint, a trust and safety standpoint, what are we doing for our risk maintenance? Um, you know, what's the maintenance we're doing as that transition happens to ensure synthetic identity fraud is being, you know, mitigated, to ensure that the uh, biometrics that are being used to authenticate and to keep your information um, secure, that that is being um, maintained over time in a very low touch but effective way. And I think the concept of risk maintenance is important as we transition, whether internal and to an enterprise, um, and as, you know, as a society as a whole, um, you know, kind of navigating this together, um, it, it takes a collective process to kind of get through that, that gap that I think will be important from a, from a trust safety standpoint, also user experience standpoint. I mean, this is definitely a big question. <laughs> I think for us, it's more online to offline. Right? I think we, the way we look at it, you know, you find a place and people online and then you're transacting in at least meeting offline and then transacting offline and online. So I think there's two parts to it. One is, of course, identity, you know, you're trying to gather as much information, I mean, biometrics, you know, and then your, you know, identity, driver's license, passport, maybe background checks, all these things, right? But eventually you're gonna go and meet the person. So I think the way we look at it is your intention is a big deal. So one is you confirm who you are, and that's the tough part to solve. But second is what's your inten intention on the platform. So I think maybe a shared pool of knowledge can help a lot. And we have been now experimenting with some companies where, let's say I scam on Rumi, then I'm gonna share, Rumi's gonna share that data. Just you that, hey, you know, I am actually a scam on Rumi, and maybe this is type of behavior I have in Rumi. Now that's shared with other companies in the shared space. And now you can leverage that to say, okay, what's my intention looks like? Because I am who I am, and I can confirm that on any platform, but my intentions are not right. So that means you can now treat that customer in a whole different way. So um, I'm going to go from a completely different angle for your question. So uh, digital identity is such a, such a large, complex issue. Um, the way that we've worked on digital identity really is much more in the context of national biometric identity. I, I spent a year in India studying Aadhaar, and um, that research is available now in Nature Springer. Um, that, was, that was a very big learning process about in terms of digital identity and how it works and how it can fail and how it can succeed, et cetera. But um, I, I want to talk about just one piece of this, which is data integrity. So there are a lot of different ways of building a digital identity, offline, online, online, offline. It, there are a lot of combinations and uh, percentages of what kind of information you want to use. But I would just say one thing. Your, the digital identity that you build is only as good as the integrity of the data that you build it with. So for example, if you purchase data broker data 
that is from marketing sources, for example, retail history purchases, um, even some public record information at this point has been totally polluted by some very big data breaches and can be um, socially engineered in a number of ways. So uh, the, the data quality has become such an issue. So biometrics, I do think actually, if you do it right, if you do it right and are have a really good process where you can ensure that the person to the bi biometric capture is secure. You have to have that those two points very, very secure. Um, otherwise, you can have a man in the middle spoof that's pretty big. Um, but if you have that secure and if you have other data elements and a variety, a rich variety of data elements that uh, you are very certain to a above 98 degree uh, percent that it's accurate and has integrity and perhaps you've had to have a team go through and clean the data and use services to clean the data. Um, I think that's, uh, that's really something to think about in terms of, okay, here's my process for identification. Here's my data integrity process. So the relying data is, is going to support your process. Great. So I mean, as we have, like, as you're talking about this process and as we're getting closer to the ability to make a decision on a user as they come on the pl platform and transact, what are some of the processes and legal uh, requirements that you need to consider when you're making that decision, like especially when you're going to be, say, declining a, a, the, the service? I, mean, I can start. Um, I mean, I, I really like your your point about the integrity. I think, kind of want to touch on that one because that kind of goes into that as well. So I think we call it like managed whatever services, right? And I think you have the you rely on the integrity of the software and the way you protect it, but then you have a team of professionals or people, you know, who are literally going through all these, you know, all the data and making sure that it's correct and maybe it's right. Maybe you remove the bad bad apples, you know. So I think in that case for us is you know. It's pretty hard because one use case we have uh, on the platform is you have to do a background check. Now legally the thing is you, you can do a background check and you can fail, but I can't tell you or publicly that hey you failed. Or maybe you have these three points that are like bad on your background check, right? And now that's where legally I, I can't kick you out of the platform. We can't do anything, but what we can do is let the user decide on that sort of process. So not showing the background check means almost that you have failed. And now the user is going to ask that, hey, you know, I do want you to be verified, and I'm not verified, so that's your decision to say, hey, you know what, maybe I don't meet the requirements, maybe my check is not good, it's not clean, so you decide and you can move off the platform. But it's really difficult, at least in some of these scenarios, to kick someone out just because they have a bad um, background check or whatever. Yeah, I do think that this is probably the area that um, gives me the most angst in the sharing economy. I think there's a lot of maturity that needs to happen. If you think about, you know, we, I'm from a more of a credit background, and if you think about just how far they've come and the regulations that have been imposed, because they weren't able to self-regulate, if you think about redlining and the discrimination that could potentially happen, um, this happens um, a fair amount in you know, short-term vacation rentals, for example. I just uh, came from a conference there. And this is something that organizations need to make more data-driven decisions. A lot of the kind of um, decisions are judgmental. And I think that's an area where a company like LexisNexis can bring you know, a fair amount of expertise in understanding just how and what is the you know non-discriminatory way to make these types of decisions and then you know if you think about what exactly are you doing are you potentially denying somebody employment are you potentially denying someone housing and so that opens up a whole new uh, view on what the sharing economy actually is oh, yeah. and so with it needs to be thought through as to how and what the process is when declining a user. Do you need to send an adverse action letter, for example, if you are using FCRA data? And so that's you know, an area that we work quite heavily in and do a lot of thinking about. But again, the industry as a whole hasn't caught up to um, where some of the other more mature industries like, like credit, for example, has. Yeah, and I think you know, how we fit into the, the, pu the puzzle is usually on the on the back end, so this le the legal considerations are done by our customers and users. But what we do is we put a lens over, you know, hey, 
you know, is this good for business? Is this, can we technology deliver operationally? How does the architecture work um, legally, right? Does it work? But the, the other lens we put on that kind of we're really, uh, I think is important, especially in this, you know, in the, the larger metric of what we're viewing here is the moral component, right? And so we can come in at the same time and say, look, we're, right now, we're clearing people very quickly who have no identity, who are getting jobs in, in Nigeria or in Uganda. Um, background checks don't exist in a lot of the markets we serve. So what's a very clear, um, fast, unbiased way to get people jobs, to accelerate hiring and, and to create, you know, and to help capture that value. And, and there also is a false positive rate to our technology. So if we were used in, a, in an isolation, we could potentially be denying good people jobs. And that's something that we uh, lose sleep over, frankly. And so we have to, we mitigate that by ensuring that our customers don't use just us, even if legal. Even if you know it makes sense from a security standpoint, the moral component has to be discovered. And to my end, the only way that can be mitigated is by a thoughtful conversation with your customers and with the users, and come together and say, "Look, we have to be we have to make data-driven decisions that are holistic, and really consider the fact that data can be can be wrong if not considered against other uh, meaningful data." So I just take it from a kind of a moral lens and something that you know should weigh on everyone in, in this kind of emerging market. So um, just to pop back to the, the question um, about the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So the Fair Credit Reporting Act, there, there are a number of ways in the United States that the Fair Credit Reporting Act would apply in the situation that you described and, and that you described. So um, if you use credit bureau data, you're, gonna, you're going to be subject to the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, Let's say you're, you're conducting a background check, um, and you've, you've got to get permission for that background check. Um, if you're going to do a full, genuine background check, it is a great idea. If there is anything to do with reputation or housing or anything remotely connected with those things involved, it's a really great idea to go ahead and um, give people their full Fair Credit Reporting Act rights. and. In an abundance of caution, this is, I think, the right thing to do. Um, the reason for this is that, let's say that you are, and I think that the three month you know, short term housing is the most risky, because let's say that someone um, is looking for a home, and they move their family, or they want to move their family into short term housing, maybe it's three months, maybe it's six months. If they fail a background check and you do not deliver adverse action notice, there is a very real possibility for litigation under the FCRA because you did not give them their full FCRA rights. So that is something to take up with legal counsel. I am not an attorney, so I'm not giving you legal advice, but I'm just saying that I do think that's a real big uh, risk area. And basically the way to think about this is, and again, I'm not giving legal advice, but I would say this. When you think through whatever processes you, you are doing or whatever you know, sharing economy piece that you're, you're working with, if, if, if something you're doing is having to determine the reputation of someone, that should raise a big red flag to go talk to a really great attorney about what you should do about that and to ensure things. Yeah. Great, thank you for that, that was a really good answer. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to another topic that you know about trust, especially in the sharing economy. Mm -hmm. A little hot button topic, but you know data and like the secondary use of it. Um, and so I think like you know what as sharing economy companies are involved in that space, like what are the mechanisms that we can use to earn trust um, of our customers, and how can we create like utilities within that sharing economy around that? I'll start this one off. So we have an elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is that I think that um, when there are very large brands that have shared personally identifiable information in an irresponsible way, I think it hurts the entire digital ecosystem. And right now we have that situation with the Cambridge Analytica issue. Um, so I do think that um, having an abundance of good practices up front about what you do with personally identifiable information, one. And then secondly, um, if you share de-identified customer information for any purpose and call it aggregate or however the terminology goes, let me 
make sure that you have really done your due diligence in how you are de-identifying that data. De-identification can run from really amazing to really weak. Um, I really enjoy getting de-identified data sets and re-identifying them. It's so simple. <laughs> and so if I can do it, um, really, can you imagine what an incredibly skilled, like just out of like college coder can do? That would be, yeah, child's play for them. So um, I do recommend that those two things are, are quite important. I'll stop there. There's more to say, but I think you guys have lots of good things to say too. Well, the one thing I would say that, and I don't have any answers here, I've, I've got lots of problems, um, yeah. but it's all about transparency and making sure that users understand um, how their data is going to be used and who it's going to be shared with. And I don't know how many times I've clicked through, accepted terms and conditions, signed in with my Facebook account, and um, basically given all that away. So, you know, I actually, because of the whole Cambridge Analytica thing, went through and looked at who has access to my Facebook data. I was astonished. And I urge everybody to go and look and kind of um, review who exactly you want access to this information. But like I said, I don't have answers. I do have problems. And the problem I have is how do you communicate in a transparent way with your consumers, who they're sharing this data with, whether it's going to be refreshed, and how you can do this in a way that doesn't create a pain for users. And I think about um, you know the this idea of cookies um, being shared on the website. I don't know how many of you have seen this cookie bar that's sort of a legislative thing, um, but now it's just an annoyance. And I just close or accept that this website's using cookies. I, I don't actually care. Um, but now I've given that right away. And so I, I think as an industry, we need to figure out how we can better communicate, create transpa transparency, and maybe um, curb some of the usage of this data with with, re with regard to the fact that we know users are going to consent to anything. I mean, um, this is. A, I mean, I was re I was reading an article about um, the whole Facebook. I mean, we're talking about it now, and the article was about Android users versus iPhone users. I don't know if you read it, read it, or maybe you know what happened. But Facebook recorded every single call and every single text you ever sent on Android phones. So you can actually download your history from Facebook and you'll see, probably see that they have data for all the calls. And if you look at iPhone users, they were not affected that much. Uh, it's, I think because it's all about the consent. I think if you use a device or use a service, I think how do you, they keep asking, hey, are you sure you want to give consent to this thing? And I think the question, I think the problem that I also have, we all trying to make it like one click. Just click on one button and it's done as fast as possible. Like one second I'm in now and I'm going to do all these things. But then the consequences, we all know it now. So I feel it's, we can't expect both to exist at the same time. That one click right away and also understanding what are the consequences of the data that you're giving to random service or companies that you might trust. So I think it needs to be both. Uh, adding some sort of you know consent where you actually understand, hey, this is how I'm going to use the data, and I think users have the right to know that, and no one wants to talk about it. They have huge you know small text in tiny, you know font size four where you can barely read it, and you say, okay, screw it, <laughs> I'm going to just gonna click on that button. That's what I think. Yeah, and I think just the flip side of the coin is that I think that all the harm that comes out of events like this will actually lead to a lot of positive and the right company that's driven by that moral engine, um, you know, look like take two different driving uh, transportation network companies side by side, call them company A and B, one's in the boardroom and in, in, their, in their management level having discussions around their customers who actually maybe care about trust and safety over um, the, re the revenue driving functions of the balance sheet and maybe B doesn't. Um, customers can feel, we can feel when that trust is genuine, not only in the words and the actions, but in the experience you get through the platform, right? So whatever is going in to authenticate us or you know, drive that decision, I, I think the good that come, come out of things like this is that a genuine companies that are driven by the, that moral element off balance sheet will essentially create a better experience and a tighter you know, grasp of the trust, security, safety issues that we're facing um, and just, you know, similar to the events vis-a-vis -vis Edward Snowden, um, largest breach of, uh, in national security history, um, but raised a lot of awareness, 
right? And so politics aside, um, there was a lot going on from people that have a lot of power taking advantage of a lot of people, and all of a sudden awareness is there, and now there's you know, systems in place that are helping, presumably, to curb some of the things that have been going on, and Congress is more aware, and so on. Similarly, in this case, my hope is that transportation company A continues to rise, and company B would hopefully rise to the occasion or, or go out of business. And trust then becomes actually um, a driving function to decision making in the boardrooms, and that that is exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. And um, one thing I would add here is that there there is a real role for ethical data governance mechanisms. So there are a lot of people at work to develop ethical data use guidelines uh, throughout the world, and I do think that this is a very important role. Every business will have to specify. Um, how that works for their sector and their particular business architecture, but a law will never give us everything we need in terms of doing the right thing with secondary uses of data because the technology and the, the ecosystem is moving too quickly. But ethics and uh, driving an ethical uh, data use conversation, that can keep up. I think a theme that was kind of getting bandied about here um, that goes hand in hand with privacy is security. Um, and like the, you can't have one without the other, it seems like these days. Like how, how do we, and this is another small question, right? But how do we go about getting both of those and, and having both of them and conveying that to our user base? Well, I, I, I'll just start off. I mean, I just think the discussion starts with the with with the customer or the user to say, look, like there will be casualties in this. We're not perfect. The systems we're trying to put in place will not be perfect. Um, so that's the first thing. I think that open communication. The second thing is that the, the company or the entity is trying to communicate some kind of um, ability to add new features, new functions, basically that there's a progression working towards, hey, this is about basically the minimum, this is all we're going to do, or we're trying to implement and try. And as long as that is communicated as essentially what it needs to be, the balance between security and privacy and everything in between, is essentially a human R&D effort to, tr to, tr you know, t to basically titrate those th th very competing often at odds elements of, of how we interact in, in any you know, ecosystem or environment. So I just think it starts with communication and two, an ability to want to go beyond what the status quo is and just innovation in the security and privacy space seen on the same side of the table and not as the security guy across from the privacy guy with the CEO and she's going to make the decision right or left. No, it's a co-created solution to a very complex, challenging problem. Um, so I think it has to start with those two things. Yeah, so I'm no, I'm no security expert, but I think that that's a no-brainer. Data should be secure, and we need to respect our users' kind of ability, and they need to trust that we are going to secure their data. What I will say is that I think we need to be more careful about what it is we store and what it is we ask for and when we get rid of it. So I think this idea of data minimization, making sure we only... Um, are requesting at the most timely moment and then persisting that information only when necessary. So you can only have what's stolen from you when you have it. And if you're able to delete that or purge that information periodically, I think that'll go a long way in establishing trust with our users. So another question, I think it's more of a general question, but as we talk about uh, these marketplaces that we're creating, at what point in the life cycle of those marketplaces do you think you start building trust? You know, do you start that on day one, um, do you, or do you have to wait until you have enough supplier growth to where it becomes necessary? When I can start this one? <laughs> um, I, I don't think there's a right answer, like when do you do it? Um, but I think for us, what we've seen, if you start setting rules from day one, then everyone knows um, that this is what's going to look like. So I think when you become a part of a community, you do sort of like kind of say yes to, okay, I want to be a part of a better community, more trusted community, or I want to be a part of a community that's like kind of scamming each other and no one knows what's really happening here. <laughs> so, and that happens all the time. You know, if you look at like Craigslist, you know, I think our, you know, common example for everything, they have no sort of issues around like, okay, we're not going to do anything. So you can keep scamming each other, totally fine, things happen, becomes a news and totally fine, you keep using the platform. But if you start adding friction, 
then you know, hey, you know what, I think I should do it too because if I do the right thing, that means everyone else also should do the right thing, then we all become a community. It's kind of like more consensus that I'm agreeing to do it, but I also expect other people to do it. So together we're building a better community. So I think from day one, then you expect that sort of behavior. Instead of changing it later on, then people start to get upset and um, stop using a platform. Yeah, and, l and let's be clear, right, it's a two-way conversation. So uh, immediately the, when the trust experience is is began it, it you know in my opinion it starts maybe even before that interaction happens right and the other important part that's critical you know when we in an advising role to some of our clients is the understanding that it's, it is both ways there you're establishing trust with the with the user or the customers but they you know you also need to be sure you're doing the same thing too not only from a an understanding in a business and marketing you know perspective but also from a security perspective because you have a you do share responsibility to your shareholders and you also have a responsibility to your employees and their families and to your other users on the field. So the, the fact that it's a two-way discussion and interaction and it's continuous and that risk as it happens along that element because this is all human-based driven and human-based risk changes over time and fluctuates and is driven by different motivations and ac actions both ways, um, establishing that dialogue with some clear rules, right? Like up front, like, hey, I'm a good person and so are you and together we're going to interact safely and in as frictionless environment as possible, but as Nick said in the brief, you, you need some friction to be able to ensure that security and safety. So I just think in that interaction, it's got to be done even before it begins, and also um, a two, in a, in a two-way in a two-way fashion that's interactive and continuous and progressive. Yeah. So all the research that I've seen on this is very clear. Not only do users want this, but they expect this. They expect these platforms to perform these duties, and in fact, they're willing to pay an additional fee for it. So I think um, this idea that we'd expect these platforms to sort of take an approach where it's not their problem is unacceptable to users, and I think that'll be very clear in the market. So um, in terms of when to start thinking about building trust, I think it comes in the planning stages of the business. It should be a stated goal of the company to have its users trust and to be a trusted company. Um, I, uh, we're doing some work with DuckDuckGo, the search engine. Um, they funded two projects uh, that were writing a, 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 a patient's guide to HIPAA update and then a, a, a guide for parents on how to you know, be safe on the internet. And um, in my conversations with them, I was absolutely struck by um, the CEO, his, his uh, dialogue around trust. And it, it was really surprising to me um, at the time, obviously, not now, but um, one of the first things he said to me is, is we, we are doing everything we can to be a trusted company and to show that in the digital ecosystem there can be trusted companies. And his emphasis on trust really makes so much sense to me now, more now more than ever. Um, but I think that uh, having that as one of your key mission components as a company is, is the right place to start. Um, and then the other thing um, I would say that really does help from a user perspective is to have very clear, clean language around anything that might be having to do with the use of their data. Um, when I look at privacy policies, and I've looked at, I don't know how many now, I've been doing privacy for a long time, this stuff can get buried in terms. Um, it can be really wiggly. Oh, well, we may share your data with, um, with partners who may have offers that might interest you bottom line translation, we're going to share and sell your data to data brokers. So look, um, tell the truth, be clear, give people the opportunity to opt out, and from a consumer perspective, be just very conspicuous and, and straightforward with your language, and that really helps. I would just end this with one thing to say, I mean, I, th I think you definitely nailed it with the, you start from day one, but also uh, the leadership, I mean, from day one, what type of company are you trying to build? I say it's very expensive. Uh, we did a roomy, and I think it's a huge risk, right? Because when you're raising capital and setting expectation for board members, investors, employees, and your users, right? You want to sort of grow. You want to show that, hey, our company is growing. But when you have your, let's say, competition B, and they don't care, and hey, let everyone in, and let's get all the users in the world, and let's do whatever we can. On the other side now, we are like, hey, stop everyone, making sure we just verify you before you can transact on a platform. Now that means 
not a lot of users. But that means long time. I mean, I think we're spending years to build that company where you have the competition, build the same sort of user base within a year or so. So I think there's a huge cost to a company, but a commitment from the entire team and the company to say, hey, we do want to build the most trusted platform in this market. And once you say yes to it, over time you'll see that you'll start to beat the competition because now people just love what you're building. And we've seen this firsthand at Rumi. I think we grew slowly yet fast, but I think we did decide to that, hey, every single, plat every single room on the platform will be verified. And we've now done over 300,000 rooms. So imagine every single room needs to upload the copy of a lease or a bill, a passport or license, whatever you name it. But that was difficult. And that took a lot of money, but time, but now we can say we're a trusted platform. Yeah, I think that goes back to kind of that classic uh, point where fraud and growth teams kind of always end up butting heads and I think it actually takes us back to our first question about friction and uh, how we minimize it but still get the trusted experience. So I think that's a good place as any to stop. Thank you everybody. Um, does it open up to the room for any questions people might have? Pat, sure. Just to um, ask a question in the previous session, the keynote um, to Airbnb um, uh, Shapiro about GDPR and portability of data. And in a way you could say Cambridge Analytica Facebook is very good because you know, it puts you know, data at the, at the center and privacy at the center, etc. But on the other hand, the way he answered the question was, well actually we have to be very careful because of Facebook Cambridge Analytica about data portability. And, and, that, and I think that was kind of you know, a bit you know, ducking you know, what the opportunity is you know, post GDPR of doing things differently, but also raises the question about is the current infrastructure of the net ready? You know, for a GDPR, or are there like a lot of innovation and infrastructure that needs to be built for that? So I just wanted to ask, you know, you what you thought about this. Did everyone hear that question? No. So the question, you know, uh, yeah, the question was, um, are, is the net ready for GDPR, basically, and what kind of innovation do we still need before we can be there? Yeah, that's a, that's the question of the hour. So yesterday, the reason I was skipping in and out of the conference is there was a big meeting with 30 European uh, DPAs. And today I'm skipping out because I'm going to go meet with Giovanni, Giovanni Buttarelli, who's the European Data Protection Supervisor. And one of the most significant issues, there are several very significant issues that GDPR brings that I think are quite challenging and that are not resolved. And I do, I can tell you, I, I think it's public record, that I can tell you that um, the Europeans do understand very clearly that there will have to be substantial innovation uh, technologically in order to do data portability and also data deletion. So, I mean, uh, and that's, that's the first thing. So, I mean, my comment back would be, how do you delete on a blockchain and retain integrity? I don't have the answer to that. It will require innovation or the law will have to be amended. You know, that's clear. But the second point, um, I, I think data portability is perhaps a little bit closer but I'm not sure in what formats, and I think each sector will have, a, so you might be able to suck your data out, but will you be able to take that data and pop it fully in a, um, in a compatible way to the next platform? So maybe data portability, but maybe need not data interoperability. So I think that's a little in interesting issue. And then the third issue for GDPR is um, artificial intelligence and very specifically machine learning, which is not necessarily explainable in the deep layers of, of the net. Um, so uh, I, I do think that there are some very challenging issues I don't think the, uh, the net is quite ready for. However, I can also tell you the DPAs have, have been very clear that they know that this will be an iterative process. But I, I think that GDPR is going to be very good for finding new technical innovations in the area of privacy. And um, I mean, May 25th, we're going to find out about how aggressive the enforcement actions are. And I think um, the GDPR on May 25th represents the starting gun, not the end point. It's, it's the start of the race. You know who the bad ones are, they have the good ones. Who are the good ones? 
So the question was, besides DuckDuckGo and Rumi, what other companies are, are already doing the right thing as far as data privacy and is concerned? There's, there's about a dozen I can name off the top of my head, but um, I don't want to endorse companies unless I absolutely, I, I, I apologize. I, I'm not trying to like say any company's perfect, but um, I'm happy to talk to you off, off stage. So the question was to to open up your product to a demographic that it wouldn't have been available to before, or that might not have been interested in it before due to their uh, proclivities. Is the is the investment worth it there to increase your due diligence to attract that demographic and get them on your platform? So absolutely. I think they are always going to be those both hosts and guests, if I can use it, or providers and consumers who take a much less conservative approach on, on the risk app, the risk that they are willing to tolerate. But we are seeing a number of companies pop up that are working with us and looking to, you know, reduce the anxiety around these P2P transactions. And so there is a huge untapped market um, of people and assets that just haven't gotten to the level of comfort that we can provide this additional sort of um, data and information that will make them feel comfortable to step into a stranger's car. And I'd, I'd ask your, your mother <laughs> if she'd ever used a cab before because and how different that is necessarily. And so it's, 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 it, we definitely have to shift some of the thinking, but there's a lot of work we can, done, can do to open up these, this si side of the market that is very um, concerned with the risk and have a has a lot of anxiety around opening up, you know, the assets to other people. Yeah, and just a final point. I, you know, I think we're seeing a lot too. You can you can make trust and security uh, marketable and and actually a you know charge a premium for it, right? So you know, if I'm using Care.com uh, for for my child, I can actually pay a premium for a more friction forward experience for that user, they're also paying a premium to kind of have that uh, higher service because they're maybe more vetted or the person at the Uber or Lyft that picks you up has a gold medallion because they've been for a more friction forward experience. So what I'm seeing from some of the, not the technology companies that are moving people and sharing, but from other more conventional users is people are actually willing to offer, um, you know, a product and services that has that, that extra layer or extra layers of security and, and people are willing to pay a premium if they're, you know, it, it, it so validated. So I think it's really exciting when you, when you see that. Just a different side of the market. Right. Time for one more and then that's it. Uh, in the back, right there. The question was about document verification and what you're using right now. 
Uh, I wish I had a solution for that one. <laughs> it's, it's really hard, right? I mean, I think we've seen a lot of cases where you'll have a lease and um, people will like Photoshop it. Um, and uh, you, <laughs> and it happens all the time. Or maybe just download a lease from internet and forgot to change the date. You know, like just simple steps, right? I mean, you can figure those out, but it's really hard to figure out these solutions to uh, verify actual document that's been modified or changed. Uh, we're looking into it ourselves. I, th I think what we've done is just maybe a, be a part of a more um, a shared ecosystem. So there are a few companies out there in the space now that connects in Airbnb and a lot of the big platforms, including Rumi. And what we do, we just share our data. So if I find that, hey, you modified some documents or whatever happened, I'm passing that information onto the platform that you might be careful with this user. So I think that's been the one way to kind of figure out who might do what sort of actions on the platform. But I'm looking for a solution. If anyone knows anything about verifying documents, I'm happy to use it. And I would just close we it. Can speak off to several. Sure. Oh, go ahead, no, Sorry, please. we can speak off to it. There's plenty of vendors right outside that would love to talk to you guys about this. So. Anyway, thank you, everybody.